Hey, Warners, this is your warning that the following episode of Women Your Mother Warned You About went a bit rogue from the beginning. You know, one of those episodes where we started the show before we started the show, you know, we were recording and then things happened. So put on your big girl panties and buck up for the ride with Rachel Pitts, Keith Walters and yours truly, Gina Tremarco. So bees, penises explode. <laughs> okay, so the the po- Facebook post I saw was a friend of mine that said when ha- when male honeybees mate, their penises explode and they die. <laughs> and I was like, is, and I t- posted, is this really true? So she sent me a full article on this. So it's like bee porn, really, because the description of this crazy thing, it's, you know, all these bees that go crazy when they find out there's a um, a virgin queen around. So, hold on. Let's just get to the good part. Oh, I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought being part. a virgin was the good part. Oh, it not for the queen. Well, she's got, like, literally upwards of, you know, thousands of male bee drone prospect oh i know how that goes i feel i feel for her the male bee he all right let's just read the whole thing he 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 has actual claspers on the end of his penis to grip to grip what queen to grip on her and then he enters, and he's trying desperately to ejaculate into her sting chamber wait 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 bees ejaculate Listen up, Gina. As the penis is everted, which it only shows up when he's in heat, the drone becomes paralyzed and does a backflip. You can't make this shit up as he ejaculates. The ejaculate, drone ejaculation is so damn powerful, the semen blast possesses such force that it's actually audible to the human ear. Apparently, it sounds like a pop. This little exchange also explodes the penis entirely, or rather, it ruptures it from the drone's body, allowing it to remain inside the queen's vagina. But fret not. This mating sign... <laughs> fret not, Keith. And men listening. Fret not. This mating not. sign does prevent further penetration from other drones. Oh, it does... It does prevent other penetration from other drones, rather just the prevention of semen loss. There we go. And And... And of course, you can imagine the drone bee dies after that. So, I mean, is it a, what I guess that, the moral the dr- of the, the story the is: male? Aren't you glad you're not a bee? Is the drone the male? Guy? Yeah, the male. So the drone the queen is. So the, the drone female. ejaculates with his claspers, and then he dies. After his cool. penis explodes. <laughs> well, yeah, after the backflip and the penis. Explodes. I mean, I can well, I can handle insects, a backflip, but the penis thing is. Wait, 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 wait! Yeah, I, that's I even want, worse. I want a man who's going to do a backflip after he ejaculates. Don't they <laughs> that all? would be funny to well, watch. Well, I think there's it's there's some interesting um, situations in in uh, nature where I think the praying mantis she eats the male after they consummate is what I think happens. That's correct. So why would a man? Yep. Wh- why would a man? Um, of that species. What did you, what is that? the praying mantis? Why would a male praying mantis ever get involved? I think they he's don't that, know that he's that happen. stupid and horny that he's going to do it. Well, it's instinctual. And I think he doesn't, he doesn't know realize that. he's going to die. I don't think they stupid. talk about Guys, that. They don't talk. Yeah. yeah. Keep it to themselves. They don't, they don't mention that Wait, or they might, but the sexual power of the female is so strong that they don't care. Which, They'd rather die that way. You know, way. And, and you got me into reading Game Changers and now I'm like, so we need to have a conversation about this book. I'm so into that book and that whole section about sex. I was like, it blew my mind. And I was trying to share some of this information with, uh, oh, with our, with our mutual hairstylist about the whole the things I'm sure she probably can't handle. <laughs> <laughs> I was some of the learnings I got about peak performance in general based on men and women's oh, orgasms sure. was astounding. Keith, have you read Game Changers by Dave I Asprey? I have not. What is oh the, my, what is the concept oh. topic? The I'm, I'm a huge I'm I would say this book and probably 
pussy a reclamation of Gina Thomas Hour, my two tops right now. And Game Changers is he's a biohacker, and he basically he was um, a Silicon Valley, you know, genius when he was young, and then he went on to go around and interview like 400 of the top uh, success leaders in, in in the world and find out what makes him tick. And then he's biohacking to figure out how to be most productive, how to make his brain work as best as possible. And he goes into um, eating habits, sex habits, sleep Sleeping. habits, all the habits that are best optimizing your brain Exercise power. habits, how you should run or not run in aerobics. And like, it's... It's a really, it's really good book. It's such a good book. If you look at my Audible, it's the, those. look at the two books that are the first two books that come up. Uh-huh. <laughs> Pussy and Game it's, Changers. Yeah. And I've listened to Game Changers probably three or four times because some you of it is so You have to listen to so it more intense. than once. Yeah. But um, the basic premise of the sex part is that, uh, and I'll paraphrase because he gets better into the science of it, is that men sometimes get caught up and I think women too we get caught up in the uh, the finishing point of, you know we get caught up in the orgasm we get caught up in the climax and then we miss out on the actual benefit of the entire process and then he goes a little further into it that some of the Buddhist masters and things they talk about you really shouldn't be worried about the climax because for men, it actually weakens yeah. weakens you after that happens. So there's part of it that he gets us into is that you really shouldn't have an ejaculation except for once every seven days for optimal performance and lengthening your life every, once every 30 days. Yeah. But not to be so caught up in, I got to have an ejaculation every time I have sex. But that's kind of the you know typical scenario of what people think is supposed to happen like, well what, what was also mm-hmm. interesting is that the less you and i don't think this is the show yet but anyway the less the more time that goes on for a man not to have an ejaculation increases the, t- the testosterone and what ends up happening is that increase in testosterone increases performance in general with everything else but also attracts more women it's that kind of like those pheromones are going out there because of the higher testosterone as a result of not ejaculating keith (laughs) yeah i think that's an excellent uh actually i've read some stuff i haven't read this book but you get into topics like uh a tantric approach to um a physical relationship and for men to learn how to separate orgasm from ejaculation um that you know, there's 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 a lot to that. Um, so, I, I this is going to be very interesting to read. I mean, I think a lot of people approach the bedroom or with with as a goal oriented approach instead of an yeah. intention and communication oriented approach, mm-hmm. and they approach it from a sexual perspective instead of a sensual perspective. Two totally different ways to look at things. Yeah. So this is not really our episode today, Doug. By the way. Um, what are we talking about today? I thought it was orgasms or ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> what better topic could there oh, be? Oh, God. We should have that episode, Follow the One About Your Period. I saw the period one comes out on July 4th. <laughs> yes. What better day? <laughs> yes. And trust me, it was very strategic. Because <laughs> no one's going to listen to it? Is it's that why? just a quieter week. Oh, God. <laughs> or you could look at it as fireworks, or you could look at it as independence. Well, how are we? Maybe we should switch it and put the orgasm one on July 4th. <laughs> ah. All right, what are we talking about today? What, why are you resisting? <laughs> oh, here we go again. Here we go again, two against one. Are we talking about orgasms? Well, I thought we were talking about game changers and all the things that you can do. To- okay, we could talk, we could talk game changers. Yeah, there's also there's a whole lot of I mean, there's so many levels to what Dave Asprey talks about in his book. Um, I the uh, nootropic mm. drugs is another interesting, and I had a really hard time with that section at the first time I listened to it because he goes into these brain enhancing drugs um, and some psychedelics. Now, as a sober person, I definitely don't think I would 
Never say never, but I don't think that I would go into the um, hallucinogenics because it's probably not a good idea. But some of the brain enhancing drugs, it's interesting. There's a movie and I just so happened to have watched it before I listened to the book again recently. It's called Limitless. Mm -hmm. And it's a great movie if you haven't seen it. And it goes into this guy. He gets a hold of some of these uh, like the earlier versions of these nootropic drugs and it kind of doesn't go well obviously because but the thing that's cool about it is he figures out like he suddenly takes this pill and he's he's really he's not high but he's super aware and he like finishes his book and he starts to um evolve in terms of his thought processes and he just goes on to these crazy amazing things but you know what if I took a pill that wasn't didn't make me high, but it made me be able to focus better that I could finish writing that darn next book, you know, and and some of these nootropics, one of which is coffee. Okay, so so let's I'm going to pause you for a second because this I feel like we have a theme here all the time with when we do this three something that we start talking. And so this is I think we have a theme of like when the three of us are together, we do a rogue show. Where we just start, so I'm going to call it the Rogue Show. So it's t- it's that time of the sh- of the show to do a very informal introduction to you. welcome to Women Your Mother Warns You About, where the three of us go rogue. I'm Gina Tremarco, owner, operator, founder of Pivot Ten Results, and Carolina Improv. And on to you, Rachel. Rachel Pitts, mom, realtor with BRG, and many other things, including creator of The Closing Curve. And And uh, how about the man behind the mic? I'm Keith Walters, and I build great companies, and it is so wonderful to see you ladies. (laughs) What are we talking about today? I think our main thing that, I think what we got into, because we start to improvise these conversations, we were talking about Game Changers, the book, and Rachel talks about it all the time. And then I was finally like, let me listen to it. And I just started because I don't read. Thus, for anybody um, who doesn't know, Rachel has a book. She gave me some hell for not reading her book. Not really. She just questioned me. And I'm like, I don't read. I listen. So we're both into this Game Changers book. And I think this might be a good theme. I think I think we can fill time with this concept. And you have read the whole book several times. I'm only a portion in. Oh yeah, you'll you'll love it, and Keith, you'll love it, and anybody out there who cares at all about maximizing your productivity in and maximizing your time and just performing at your best, whether you're an athlete or you're in business or you're just, uh, and I, let me remove the word just, or if you're a stay-at-home mom and you just want to maximize your energy. Um, mm-hmm. It's just there's so many good tips, and as I started going on and on I'll go on into any of these subjects and go on and on forever about the nootropics about sleep which is probably my worst downfall um and at the very end the the one thing that he says is his biggest takeaway that the author of the book from all of the interviews of people is the main game changer is gratitude yeah which is something Brennan Brown talks a lot about like if you want to get to joy it really starts with gratitude And so it's kind of interesting. I like his approach because he's interviewed so many different people, what, 400 plus people, every walk of life, every, I I mean, from shamans to scientists to, I mean, so many different people that have introduced to him different ways to change the game. But he's not just doing that interview and that research. He's actually like walking the walk. He actually experimented with everything, right? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of the almost all of the nootropics. Oh, and he's very he is great about disclosure of what he does has tried and what he hasn't tried. He's very uh, open about the experiments that he did in terms of the sexual stuff um, <laughs> with with the um, permission of his wife, Doctor with the per- Doctor. What's her name? Doctor Awesome Sauce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's she's willing to put up with that. Yeah. And I, you must not have gotten to the part where he gets into stem cells and how injecting stem cells into certain parts of your body can enhance performance. Oh, I have not. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I just... Whether it be your knee or you're not your knee. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I just got past the whole section on sex. 
which I found fascinating because when we think about, I mean, this is nothing new. Any kind of aerobic activity is going to create a release of different hormones that have an impact on your body. So that's nothing new when it comes to sex, but it was really interesting. The game changer. (laughs) I tried to talk to the, I tried to talk about this to a guy about like, if you don't ejaculate for seven days, it's really good for you. He was not buying that. (laughs) Well, and also sometimes like Keith was saying, there's like a performance and a like a an expectation sometimes when people go into sex that it's it needs to be this or I'm not you know that if i if I don't ejaculate and it doesn't end up this way, then I'm less of a man or what have you or same with a woman if i don't if I don't have an orgasm, then I'm less of a woman, but if the approach is is more of an experience then um people don't walk away from it feeling bad about themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of problems in the world of sex because people have that expectation going into it. Well, I find it interesting because it's completely, when it comes to the sex piece of it uh, in the book, that it's kind of opposite approach between men and women, right? It's like men, you don't need to orgasm. Women, the more you do, the better. Holla. And I think that is such like, why do not more people know about that? Because this would improve relationships. Because I'd be like, babe, don't worry about it. It's all good. I got it. (laughs) Don't worry about it. Just saying. (laughs) Well, again, it's one of those subjects that are so taboo that people are afraid. Like taboo, like having your period. Well, people don't want to talk about things that they think will expose weakness or um, make them feel less worthy or something when they actually when they explore a subject like that they might find out that it's all good (laughs) Keith as usual Keith I can't wait to hear what you have Keith any thoughts so far (laughs) no okay so Keith I love you know what Keith is such a strong... Did you dim the lights over there? <laughs> <laughs> what so, is that supposed to mean? <laughs> so just just for our listeners, just so you know, we we do do this on video. We are going to put these on on YouTube one day. We use a video format so we can see each other. So while you may not see us, um, it's how we are able to record by seeing each other's faces. And what's funny is watching Keith who's a very smart, articulate man with a lot to say, but for some reason, he just goes quiet with us a lot. I have nothing to add to the conversation yet. That's fine. That's what Keith said. I mean, that's your tagline, but whatever. (laughs) Uh, So back to you, Rachel. Any, anything else that stands up in, stands out in the book? (laughs) Okay, you got you got past the sex section, or did you? <laughs> no more standing up. Standing out. Hey, Warners, you have probably heard me talk on several occasions about how much I love wearing red lipstick. Lipstick is just one of those things that makes me feel good about how I look. And sometimes a little extra enhancement to my lips from Dermavogue doesn't hurt either. I've known Dr. Jim Turek of Dermavogue for years. He is not only my doctor who keeps my body healthy. He and his Dermavogue team keep my face looking healthy and maybe a little younger, maybe. I mean, I love it when people say, something looks different about your face, but they can't really tell because that's really what you want. You want to go to a place that makes your face look as good and it makes people wonder what happened. So what's really cool about Dermavogue being our premier sponsor of this show is the fact that I'm a client and I was a client before they became a partner of the show. So we're excited about that. Dermavoke has been offering the Greater Myrtle Beach area the best in cosmetic and aesthetic dermatology since 2003. Opened by Dr. James Turek, Dermavoke combines expert medical knowledge with cutting edge technology, bringing you the most effective, flawless solutions to any skincare or cosmetic need. Their patients enjoy only the absolute best in laser technology, including 
photodynamic laser therapy, hydrofacials, and V-beam laser treatments, as well as the latest fillers such as Botox, skin peels, facials, and more. At Dermavogue, they engage you in the process of total body health to ensure your satisfaction with their comprehensive selection of the most up-to-date, non-invasive cosmetic, dermatology, and spa treatments. It's human nature to want to look your best, right? Let Dermavogue help you get there. Schedule your consultation today by calling 843 847-2444 357-2444 or visit Dermavogue.com and tell them that the women your mother warned you about sent you. You can also find them on our website. Go check it out. The other section that I found really um, got me was the one about sleep. Yeah. And yeah. it's amazing how, and I think we've touched on this in previous episodes about how destructive lack of sleep yeah. can be to people's brain function. And I mean, I speak from experience of spending several years of functioning on like four and five hours of sleep at the very best um, due to too many jobs. And it it's just not, it's terrible for you. And I think society is, is t- making it is, has a turning point now of people in higher positions of productivity are realizing that they need more sleep so that they can optimize. Whereas it used to be like work yourself to death. And um, some of these people that Dave Asprey interviews, one in particular is the, the woman who created Huffington yeah, Post. Ariana Huffington. She, that's a well-known, she, she hit her head, hit the desk and she had to go to the hospital. Yep, she was working herself way too hard. And then she came to the realization that, you know, she she just needed to back off. And what's interesting is people like, I mean, when I was functioning on four or five hours, I was still getting stuff done. But I think I was not realizing that I was kind of a zombie. And I definitely probably could have performed better. But sometimes you just do what you got to do. and doesn't mean that it's a good idea. So now people are realizing that more sleep is super important. And um, he goes into how bad it is, the, the different types of light that are being emanated. Oh, uh, that was my from, favorite. The, the, from the, the effects from of your light. Phone. Yeah. yeah. And and um, why it's important, the, the, the colors of the light. And mm-hmm. it has to do with your brain gets confused yep. with blue light yep. at night. And red light. And red light. Red light for the, the blue, sunrise. Right. The blue light makes your brain think it's still daytime rather than the red light at night kind of easing you off because it feels like sunset. And that's why you can buy these red glasses and, you know, red lights at night and all this stuff. It's very fascinating. Yeah, you know, I, there's been a, I recently saw a presentation, not this guy, but another speaker who spoke on the topic. And I, he had thrown some statistics out there that were just amazing around sleep. And, you know, needing seven to nine hours on a regular day. But he also had some stats about impact of lack of sleep on teenagers. And one now, uh, one, one of the stats he threw out was that one hour of sleep loss for a teenager below eight hours has a five, uh, 58% increase in suicide ideation. Um, and yeah. And so, you know, the, the need for sleep changes a little bit as we age, but you know, teens especially especially need a a lot of sleep and our systems kind of go against that and then one of the you know kind of getting back to the uh um to the sex talk um (laughs) you know the point being the the point that was made by this person multiple times was your bed is for two things and two things only it's not for watching tv in it's not for reading in it's for two things and two things only and if you do more than those two things in your bed, then you're training your body not to sleep in your bed. That's interesting. And Gina, one of the, one of the other things is that uh, going along with what Rachel was talking about as far as the light, but you know, no use of the video or mm-hmm. TV screen or anything for an hour before bed. And yeah, and you might want to start reading a real book. Was one of the things he said. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, it's true that that's a that's a big one um, uh, without getting too personal. There are there are people who can't seem to go to bed without a TV on and they and they claim that they need the TV on in order to go to bed. And I don't want to take that away from them, but I got to wonder 
what is the true impact on those people who say, I cannot go to sleep without the TV on? That's an issue I've always had. I cannot sleep with the TV on, mostly because of the light, not necessarily the right. sound. Right. And after reading this book on that, that chapter in particular, last night specifically, we've got this Nest system in our house and it's wacky because... I don't know, I feel like like the government's watching me or something, but the light goes on and off every time I move. It's like some kind of motion detector that notices my movement. So every time I roll over, this blue light goes off and it makes me fucking crazy and it disturbs my sleep. And so finally last night after listening to this book, I put like a blanket over the thing, whatever the thing is, because I, I threatened to take it down and someone told me I, I couldn't. So I put something over it so that I no longer see the blue light admit, admit, emitting. And it made such a difference. Like I can't, I can't handle that, that whole blue light. But I think people who sleep with the TVs on swearing that that's the thing for them, they don't realize the impact it's having. Yeah. The other thing is, does it impact your sleep patterns? Because, you know, that's what your brain repairs itself in the deepest moments of sleep, there's four layers of sleep. And in the third layer of sleep is where your memories are built. And your fourth layer of sleep is where your brain repairs itself. And do you ever get down to those troughs or, you know, you're always being disrupted? I know I hardly ever get down to those troughs. It's bad. I admit it. Like I don't sleep. Sometimes I will. And I know it when I sleep really, really deeply. It's one of the, you know, a night when I go to sleep and I wake up and all the time went by and I didn't even hardly move. And that's when I think I get to that deep place. But I sleep really lightly. And I think um, that's a mom thing. Since I had my child, I sleep really lightly. If there's no one in the house at all, I'll sleep like the dead. If my child is in the house, if my husband is, is, is sleeping next to me, I sleep really lightly. I wake up at everything. Yeah, that's not a mom thing. That's a parent thing, I think. Because th- I went, uh, through, the, yeah, I went parent through the same thing. thing. But you know, there's, yeah, there's you some, just, some of the yeah. technology around sleep, like, these weighted blankets. I don't know if you've seen the weighted blankets that you can buy now. These bed chillers. Um, and then you talk about the lighting. Like Philips has a bulb called the Hue bulb but that you can change the Hue or you can program the Hue for different times. You know, there's there's nice. there's all kind of things you can do. Make it as dark as you can. You know, make it cold, yeah. cold like a cave. Uh, there's one, there's a light that in Felix's house since we have the two house issue still, which is, you know, a great problem to have sometimes. Uh, his his um, air conditioning system has a blue light and it shines. It's really bright. And I keep going, I just need to get a piece of duct tape and put it over it or a blanket like Gina did because it's it's a bright blue light all night long and it doesn't go off. It just stays on. It's the air conditioning. Oh, that, that makes me crazy. I can't do it. Yeah. Uh, what came up in there was this came up in Game Changers, um, and I did this yesterday after reading it. Um, it's called The Power of When. Have you done this, Rachel? Mm-mm. So, The Power of When, it's actually a quiz that you can take at the Power of When quiz.com, and it's What's Your Chronotype? Oh, so it, I didn't take it. It, it talks about what's your chronotype because there are different, we have these different types of. What kind of sleepers are we? And so one is like you're either a bear. um, I'm trying to look through this now. I ended up being a bear, a lion. um, A wolf and a dolphin. There we go. A wolf. or And at first I thought I am for sure a dolphin. And then I took the quiz and I'm like, I'm a bear. Which a bear is like what like 50% of the world is like kind of on this normal sleep structure but it's interesting to look at the, those four different structures of those four different chronotypes because are you working to your best capacity are you doing your best performance based on really what makes sense for you from a sleep perspective and he talks about that in the book that he's better he's better when he gets up at 8:45 in the morning and and one of the experiments is and I did this this morning sleep until you wake up Because that's going to get for one week, sleep until you wake up, because that's going to tell you what your body needs. And you might be a better performer at night versus during the day, right? And so when you look at creatives, most creatives are better at night than they are during the day on getting work done. So instead of subscribing to this is the expectation, these are the norms, 
work within your chronotype of what makes the most sense for you. So I thought that was an interesting quiz. And I was surprised I came up as bear. I'm going to do it again. I don't believe it. I'm going to take, I'm going to actually take the quiz because the first time I listened to the book, I was like, oh, for sure, I'm a lion. Uh huh. And I know, like, my daughter is a wolf for sure. Her dad is a true wolf. Like, they would stay up all night and sleep as late as mm-hmm. possible. And that's the, do- yeah. that's the wolf. Um, but then the last time that I listened to the book, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'm a dolphin because sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and work for a few hours because I yep. can't sleep. And then I go back to sleep and I like the morning and I wish I could have a siesta. And a dolphin is the one that's kind of sleeps, right? you know, has really irregular patterns. So I'm not sure. So I'm going to take the action. Yeah, take it because I thought for sure I was a dolphin and then I took it and I turned out to be a bear. And I, I, I really am still struggling to believe that, but. What was the most interesting thing about that whole situation is what he, the author of the book, mentions that, you know, we're programmed to think that, oh, the early bird gets the worm and you should be getting up yeah, early and yeah. getting up early. And I actually preach that all the time, like, for instance, to my husband, but he's he's a bear. He sleeps he sleeps hard and he sleeps a lot and he doesn't like to get up early in the morning, but he's super productive. So I just have to, like, let him be what chronotype he is. Because that's what he is. He sleeps a whole... He's got the sleep thing down. (laughs) Well, and what's interesting, when he talks about the early bird gets the worm, because if you don't get up early to get the worm, there will be no more worms. And that's how most people think. And you need to kind of change that thinking. Doesn't demand for worms go down during the middle of the day, so there's more of them available? He may he may have mentioned that. I mean that that might be part that might be p- part of it too. It's so uh, maybe you don't need as many worms. I don't know. You should take the quiz, Keith. I will do that. I'm, I've got it down to, to buy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, are we really going to get him to read a book we suggest? <laughs> <laughs> and he and then of course he goes into the last section of the book talks about meditation and gratitude and all of that stuff of course and and he says you know it was one of those overreaching themes that in interviewing all of these highly productive people and successful people and what have you that he said they could they they didn't have to say meditation they could say whatever the heck they wanted to say but they a lot of these people did mention that meditation was really important and I totally agree of course and and he goes into the fact that it's also hard it, like meditation is hard to do in today's world that's overstimulated but that doesn't mean that it's still not a really good idea to try to get into it even for short periods of time Keith do you meditate in a sense, I do, not from a traditional perspective, but you know, there's the idea that anything that puts you into an alpha brainwave state is a meditative state. So in that sense, yes. Every day. What do you do? A series of a series of exercises I do first thing in the morning that's kind of okay. mindless, but okay. I do it I do it only in the dark with no sound and um and kind of lose my point in time reference while I do it. Well, I mean, he talks about that in the book about about getting to an altered state of mind, however you're going to get to an altered state of mind. Right. And, and that, I think that's really what the theme of the book is, of, of, of altering your state of mind. Um, you want to talk about the, the, drug pro- <laughs> the drug portion of the book, Rachel? Um, yeah, the nootropic drugs. Again, those are, there's a whole different, gamut of these different types of drugs that are brain enhancing and um, help with focus and he goes into some of these hallucinogenic drugs as well and um, really interesting section on LSD which I am not um, saying is a great idea it's just an interesting topic that he talks about and um, that some of these thought leaders have microdosed Mm -hmm. LSD Um, not like fully utilizing it so that they are tripping balls and like trying to jump off a roof, but a micro dose of it for an enhanced brain experience. And um, it's interesting, but he, he's very specific about if you're going to try any of these type of hallucinogenic uh, brain altering states that he always does it with, you know, supervision of some sort. But then there's the nootropic drugs that are just like focus enhancing and brain optimization. It's interesting. He was talking about going to a party and there were all these like 
influential leaders there and he started nobody really wanted to be he's interviewed all these people but nobody actually wanted to be put on record for it but most everyone that was like really successful and high performing had experimented in in some way with with some version of those drugs but didn't want to talk about it but there that that was a correlation that he was able to kind of look at that and look at how that actually can impact performance and Keith, you seem to be like nodding your head, like you're like, yeah, I'm so familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you've done it. I'm just saying that it looked like a familiar conversation topic to you. Yeah, the 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 person who was this was actually a Vista speaker was talking on the same topic and talked about the microdosing. It was an interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, one thing about the number one thing about it is number one, some of these drugs are illegal, so nobody wants to be busted right. for doing something illegal. There's that, but there's also the the perception of society of uni- using any kind of drugs or mind enhancing things whatsoever. And Dave Asprey goes on to point out that back in the you know 80s and 90s, he had on his LinkedIn profile. If, if LinkedIn existed that long ago, probably not in the 80s, but early on when LinkedIn exists, let's say, that he had mentioned that he meditated. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like a woo mm-hmm. like laughable thing, yeah. you know, maybe even 10 years ago that people are like, oh yeah, that's, that's one of those hippie people that meditates. And now everybody's coming out and admitting that meditation is crucial. You know, once Oprah condones it, you know, everybody's all yeah. in. But, um, and he's saying that, in the future, some of these brain enhancing drugs and nootropics and what have you are going to be a little more commonplace and won't be so out of the norm. I mean, look at the fact that, you know, medical marijuana is now acceptable in some parts right. of, of the United States. That's taken some time for that to come about. And again, you can, you can have your opinions on that, whatever, which way it is, but slowly but surely it's being a little bit more sus- acceptable in society. But he also talks about another form of nootropics is caffeine, mm-hmm. right? So, it's not just about LSD and hard drugs, and there are legal, mind-altering, um, brain-enhancing per- drugs that you can do. Caffeine is one of them. He went into a whole thing about nicotine mm-hmm. and how, how impactful nicotine can be in that regard. I don't think that means you need to smoke a cigarette, but there's a variety of things that can can alter your your brain to a higher performance. There was a moment of listening to the book where I was like, hmm, where do I get my hands on some of those things? Oh, yeah. I've researched some of them, and it's it's one of those things that I haven't pulled the trigger on some of it yet, but I'm certainly that and watching the movie Limitless, which, you know, it's totally a bit fantasized, but like going, I wonder that, how that feels, just to have a little bit more focus, because you know you've had those days. Yeah. Everybody's had those days where like, I'm super focused, and I'm getting it done, and what's that perfect mix of what I ate that morning, and how yeah. much sleep I got, and and um, what happened the day before, and did I exercise, did I meditate, like that's creating that perfect storm of productivity, and you know, what are things that I can add or take away to my current existence to get that experience more often I, I think that's the key of it when you look at the summary of the book of game changers it is what are all the things that you can do cumulatively to have the best possible performance from sleeping to eating to brain enhancing drugs to exercise like it's it's taking all of those things and putting them together and I remember posting something on Facebook not that long ago I mean I've been kind of slack but I'm I'm not as consistent as I want to be, but my best mornings are when I get up and I, I journal and I meditate and I pray and I write and I work out. Where is it? I actually, I actually keep it on my desk. So I remember to do all these things. Oh, when I plan my day. So planning my day comes last, but I have like this daily routine. When I follow that daily routine, it's so amazing and I posted something about it and someone said oh it's your miracle morning and I had no idea what they were talking about but then from this book game changers he talks about someone else's book called miracle morning and that's really those things are part of setting up your miracle morning and the most successful people follow that routine did he talk in his book very much about the impact of stress Yes. And you know, stress yes. you know, stress is the opposite side of the meditative thing or, or some of these others because mental stress is one of the biggest impacts on health yeah. in the US and probably everywhere. 
but there's nothing there. It's all mental. It's all it's all um, self induced impact on our own health. But, but and so thing, that means that the the flip side is possible as well, right? That, and and the, and he talks about this at length because how stress impacts your brain, impacts your hormones, mm-hmm. impacts everything that it, it it emits is what leads to autoimmune diseases, which leads to like that is like your downfall. Stress could destroy everything but stress is not physical it's all generated in our own mind right but the thing is is that our brains are wired for fight or flight or freeze or yeah and and because that's part of our dna Mm -hmm. that's what creates the trauma because the brain is just the the brain is so wired for fight or flight that it doesn't understand Anything other than that. And so you almost have to, you have to rewire the brain to get out of fight or flight mentality. I'm going to keep on saying freeze. It's fight, fight, flight, or freeze. And freeze is really important because this is the deer in the headlights. This is the, you get stuck with a question. Yeah. You get uh, somebody, you know, somebody comes at you with, puts you on the spot, maybe pulls a gender thing on you and you freeze. You don't know what to do. So yeah. sorry, I won't go away from that. No, but, no, I like um, that. But it, yeah, it's amazing how your the things that your body can do, and if you start working on those positive aspects to balance it out, the meditation, the exercise, and all those, yeah. that's that's your body controlling itself to a degree. Exactly. exactly. And then one, one of the challenges that I've always had with that is how do you differentiate between stress and pressure? Pressure being good, stress being bad. Mm. Does so, he get? To, I haven't finished the book, Rachel. Does he get into that? I don't think he does, um, but that makes a good point because it seems to me that the pressure of a deadline can sometimes be good because it gets you going towards your goal, but it's the stress that we put on ourselves that's the bad part. Yeah, and so there's a fine line there between, you know, because I enjoy high pressure. Um, it, the, it's, it's when it turns negative. It, it's, it's when it's stress. That's a, that's a yeah. good point. I don't mind pressure. Pressure actually inspires me and motivates me. Yep. I love a good deadline. Yeah. I like pressure too. Stress makes me want to cut a bitch. Just saying. <laughs> Call the popo. Put me away. <laughs> well, and stress is what causes people to cut a bitch. And that's usually it's not because of whatever the bitch is doing in front of you. It's all of the other stress that's underlying that or it's our response to some of the pressure or Correct. not being able to deal with situations and it's stuff that bottles up that suddenly you're out there cutting a bitch when it's really not this bitch's fault. Right, because it's all underlying. It's everything that we carry with us and and and, and there are triggers that come up because of someone's behavior or actions that bring up other shit that we have to manage and deal with. And uh, But it, it's it's up to us to remove ourselves from those situations that create stress. Because we allow it to happen. I mean, I am so guilty of that. I allow shit to happen and for people to stress me out. Or let me rephrase that. I allow people's behavior to cause me to stress myself out. And that's where the journaling and writing down your gratitudes and your happiness yeah. and so forth can balance that out. There's another person who comments on this. His name is Sean Aker, and he has a great TED Talk. Um, and he's funny as can be. Um, I've seen him in a couple of conferences as well, but he talks a lot about gratitude and happiness and journaling those items and, and how over a period of time doing that on a regular basis can increase your happiness. While it's at the same time as what it's doing is reducing your stress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and the thing about gratitude is a lot of times we stress ourselves out. Like I can speak to it right now. I I'm all stressed out because so-and-so deal is supposed to close and this is that is supposed to happen. And I'm all stressed out about what, I, how I want things to be. And as soon as I pull myself back and I'm grateful for what I already have rather than what's not going the way I want it, then it, it immediately simmers me down and just like, it's peaceful because I mean, if you're listening to this podcast in a free country, then that right there is enough reason to be mm-hmm. super grateful. Yeah. Amen. If you're listening to this podcast at all, that means that you have some sort of a device in your yep. possession that you are are uh, lucky enough to have. 
You know, there's so many reasons and we, a lot of times with all the things and the, the things we want to achieve in our ambitious lives, we forget about the fact that we should be grateful for the people around us and the fact that certain people are still in our life with us and the moments we have with our children. And, you know, there's just so many things that if you have eyes to see and you have air to breathe, you have reasons to be grateful for sure. Always. But I think you have to, you have to take the time to practice that. And when I get away from it, I can feel it. I can feel the difference when I get away from it. I'm going to create like a really cute little sheet that we can like have as a download of like everything you should do in the morning. Gina's miracle morning. Gina's miracle morning. The miracle morning of the women your mother warned you about and Keith. Well, and the concepts are so very simple and you can find them in a thousand different Mm -hmm. um, personal development books of how you should simplify your morning and do your thing and not like roll out of the bed with the the alarm clock at the last minute after hitting snooze six times and jump into your day. It's a real, real bad idea and it doesn't go great. And it's so simple, but the simple things are sometimes very hard to do consistently. And let's talk about who's guilty of, and this is something I'm working on. I'm getting really good at it. Who's guilty of like rolling out of bed and looking at your phone? There's a lot of you out there doing that. Like you, you like literally start your day by looking at your phone and checking everything, your email, your social media, your calendar, like. And that's a, that's a, that's a sign of addiction. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. That's why I try to look at my calendar before I go to bed and go, okay, what's up tomorrow? Mm Mm-hmm. So that I can set my day, because sometimes, like, I typically don't do meetings on Mondays, but every now and then I have one, especially if that's the client's preference or the pro, especially if it's a prospect. But my brain is so wired to not have meetings on Monday that I can so easily fuck that up that if I don't check, if I don't look at my schedule every night before I go to bed, it, it could be a dangerous situation. And there are days where I'm like, oh my God, I didn't realize that meeting was tomorrow. So that I have no no other reason to look at my phone when I wake up. I try to I try to wake up and not look at my phone and 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 not for the first hour. I try to have a routine where I'm like, I get up, I make coffee. Bullet coffee, by the way, which is funny because that's a big part of game changers. Mm-hmm. Bulletproof coffee. Yeah, and take the dogs out. Do all of those things before I do anything before I even look at the phone. Because the second I look at the phone, I'm stressed out by shit that has to happen that I didn't really ha- that I didn't realize that that wasn't part of my agenda. Yeah, I remember having a client, and now I will, for full disclosure, I do look at my phone first thing to see if there's any messages that are urgent from people in my life that aren't in my house. But I have trained myself to not look at email because it just is like there's nothing good there to be found at all. Usually, it just makes you feel overwhelmed mm-hmm. or there's an emergency. Yeah. But I remember having a fitness client. And she was so stressed out and just all we were trying to do was reduce her stress level. And I remember asking her, what's the very first thing that you do in the morning? And she said, this is the worst. She said, I get up, I pick up my phone and I check the bank balances. Wow. And it, it, it always, she's like, and it stresses me out because that was, she's thinking about. That was stress the I fuck mean, out of me. Can you, you know. So we, that was like a, the bulk of what I did for her as her fitness trainer was to make, try to develop a different habit first thing in the morning than open up your phone and check the bank balance before you even drink coffee. Like, yeah, it was a bad one. But I, I, I definitely, I need to wean back off of that. But I have gotten myself to, I don't check email until later in the day after I've done my important things in the morning. I like the checking your bank balance thing, but not immediately. Like I no 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 in all seriousness because for me because I track revenue daily it is something that I do because it reminds me of like to make shit happen like oh there's no revenue today and so that pushes me but not first thing in the morning that would like send me into a like a panic attack <laughs> I love Keith's faces Keith, so how, what's your morning routine? So my morning routine is I get up and the first thing I do is I get on the floor and I do 40 minutes of exercises. 
And the only time I look at my phone during that period of time is to turn the timer on for a couple of the exercises I do, but I will not look at anything until I get through that. And that can, I want to be like you when I grow up. My day. What kind of exercises? Uh, core. Uh, so, um, crunches and sit ups and push ups and, um, planks. And now you should, with, do, a, you should do a video <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> you should do a video yeah. for us to put on like our Facebook page. You can't see what I'm doing, but this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> I like the idea of doing it in the dark, though, because you're actually not overstimulating yourself out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, for me, it needs to be dark and quiet. And I used to, my current bedroom is hardwood floors, but it, it, prior to that, I had a bedroom with carpet, and I wouldn't even stand up in the morning. I would slide out of my bed onto the floor and then start my exercises. But that's the video I would want. <laughs> But you know what? Some the slither, the slithering. <laughs> but that might be for some people. That's what they need. They have such a hard time getting up, and it's like if you're like, I just got to slither out and well, do it. Yeah. And for me, what happens is I could be like dead tired, but you know, Rachel, you know well, right? Ten minutes into some exercises, you know, things are pumping and blood's moving, and you're awake, and you've you haven't been startled what things, awake. What what things are pumping? My heart. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Blood is moving. Blood is moving to the appendages needed. That's right. Yeah. I mean, well, and here's the bottom line in, in, in this Game Changers book when you pick it up. Everybody's different and you're going to have a different way of doing things. So what can you, what, what can you do to make yourself more productive and optimized? And, and maybe what you're doing right now, if it's not satisfying, if it's not working for you, then play around with some of the things that you find. And maybe you need to change your sleep patterns. Maybe you can approach, maybe your work, you can switch your work schedule a little bit. Maybe you can start doing your exercise in the morning or at night. You know, there's just so many options because we're all wired differently. So much great stuff in this episode. I think, um, after list after and I'm still not finished with the book, but it really gave me some. I think I alluded to this in a message to you earlier, Rachel. I'm like, this really made me start thinking about like the approach of what we've been doing on this podcast of giving information on how you can be better, not just in business but in your life. And that's that was my biggest takeaway from this book. So something for a discussion, but it's time to wrap up this episode of things you can do to make some changes that increase basically overall your success. Any, any big takeaways from either one of you on this? So my big takeaway is for any of you gentlemen listening, just be grateful that your penis does not explode. (laughs) Ever. Hopefully. (laughs) I think that's a big takeaway. It's a big takeaway. Be happy. You're not a bee. And my big takeaway is that I don't have to eat my husband after. (laughs) (laughs) Because I like having him around. (laughs) I guess my big takeaway is the more orgasms you have, the better. (laughs) Amen, sister. As, As a woman. As a woman. And it's okay to tell your man, it's okay, baby. You don't have to. It's all good. It's better that you don't. Oh, God. (laughs) This was another episode of Going Rogue with this threesome of women women your mother warned you about. I'm Gina Tremarco with Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv. I really am very good at what I do, even though I'm rogue. Um... And uh, other things you need to know, check us out on womenyourmotherwarnsyoubout.com where you can find some really cool downloads and all the information you need to find out about us. Rachel, let's hear about you and then pop it over to Keith and then we will uh, go find some bees to kill. We don't need to kill the bees. Actually, we need to save the bees. They can handle that on their own. I'm Rachel Pitts. You can find me all over social media as a Rachel on Real Estate. And you can also find me at rachelonrealestate.com and grab your free how to buy a home guide at theclosingcurve.com. On to you, Keith. I'm Keith Walters. And you can find me by going to the womenyourmotherwarnedyouabout.com website. 
look about us and you can find the connection to my LinkedIn. Awesome. And everybody, don't forget, Warners, we love your ratings and reviews. So if you get a chance, I know it can be a little complicated. Go over to iTunes. Give us a little review. Give us a rating. Whatever you want that to be, we'll take it because the more ratings and reviews we get, the more people will find us and the more that keeps us out there. So that's that's it for this episode of Women Your Mother Warns You About. We got to go. Um, so bye, guys. Bye, Keith. Bye, ladies. Bye, Warners. This really will get serious soon. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't have to. I don't think anybody wants it to be serious. This has been a presentation of the Seller Die Network. For more podcasts that you can take out into the street and turn into money, visit SellerDieNetwork.com. <laughs>